The sun-drenched skies over southern England bore witness to the opening chapter of a pivotal struggle as the calendar turned to July 10, 1940. The Battle of Britain, an aerial confrontation that would test the mettle of nations and reshape the course of World War II, had begun. The names of British and German pilots, Spitfire aces like Douglas Bader and Hurricane stalwarts like Keith Park, alongside the formidable German Luftwaffe led by Hermann Göring, would become etched in the annals of history, a testament to the courage and sacrifice of those who soared amidst the clouds. The stage was set over the English Channel, where the white cliffs of Dover stood as sentinels against an impending onslaught. The names of RAF airfields, Biggin Hill, Hawkinge, and Kenley, became the nerve centers from which the defenders of Britain's skies, the Royal Air Force, launched their sorties. The Spitfires and Hurricanes, their iconic silhouettes etching graceful arcs against the azure canvas, became symbols of resilience in the face of an ominous adversary. Adolf Hitler, having secured victories across mainland Europe, sought to cripple Britain's air defenses in preparation for a planned invasion. The names of British leaders, Winston Churchill, Hugh Dowding, and Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Park, found themselves at the forefront of a battle to safeguard their nation's freedom. The British people, under the shadow of the impending blitz, looked to the skies with a mix of trepidation and hope. The Luftwaffe, its pilots hardened by victories in Poland and France, embarked on a campaign of aerial supremacy. The names of German aces, Adolf Galland, Werner Mulders, and Günther Lutzow, became synonymous with daring dogfights as they clashed with their counterparts in the Royal Air Force. The skies over Britain echoed with the staccato of machine gun fire and the roar of engines as two formidable air forces collided. The Battle of Britain, unfolding in the vastness of the heavens, saw the names of iconic aircraft, Messerschmitt Bf 109, Junkers Ju 87 Stuka, and the aforementioned Spitfire and Hurricane, become the protagonists in a high-stakes drama. The air raid sirens wailed over London as German bombers, escorted by swarms of fighters, sought to break the spirit of the British people. The names of British cities, London, Coventry, and Southampton, bore the brunt of the relentless onslaught, their streets echoing with the sounds of air raid shelters and the drone of enemy planes. Amidst the chaos, the indomitable spirit of the British people emerged as a beacon of defiance. The names of ordinary citizens, Londoners seeking refuge in the underground, ARP wardens patrolling the darkened streets, and the valiant crews of anti-aircraft batteries, underscored the collective will to endure. The Blitz, an onslaught that aimed to break the morale of a nation, instead ignited a flame of resilience that would burn bright throughout the darkest days. As the Battle of Britain raged on, the names of airfields and radar stations, Duxford, Tangmere, and Bordsey, became linchpins in the defense against the Luftwaffe. Radar, a nascent technology at the time, emerged as a silent guardian, its operators guiding British fighters to intercept incoming raids with unparalleled precision. The Battle of Britain became not just a contest of aircraft and pilots but a testament to the synergy of technological innovation and human courage. Throughout the summer of 1940, the names of individual dogfights, such as the relentless clashes during the hardest day on August 18, 1940, became milestones in a battle of attrition. The skies, painted with the trails of vapor and smoke, bore witness to the valor of men on both sides. The names of fallen pilots, on both sides of the conflict, became a poignant reminder of the human cost of war in the ethereal realm of aerial combat. The resilience of the RAF, bolstered by the names of Battle of Britain squadrons, no. 303 Squadron composed of Polish pilots, number 92 Squadron, and the legendary number 617 squadron among them, became a symbol of Britain's determination to stand firm against the tyranny that threatened to sweep across the continent. The names of Air Vice Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory and Air Vice Marshal Sholto Douglas encapsulated the leadership that steered Britain through the tempestuous skies. September 15, 1940, emerged as a pivotal day in the Battle of Britain, a day often referred to as Battle of Britain Day. The names of squadrons and individual pilots, such as the famed Polish ace Joseph Frantisek, became heroes as they repelled wave after wave of German attacks. The tide of the battle shifted, and the collective sigh of relief echoed across Britain. The turning point of the Battle of Britain marked not just a military victory but a testament to the indomitable spirit of a nation. The names of ordinary citizens, children evacuated to the countryside, families huddled in Anderson shelters, and communities rebuilding amidst the ruins, 
underscored the resilience that became the backbone of Britain's resolve. As the autumn winds swept away the smoke and echoes of the Battle of Britain, the names of those who had stood against the storm emerged as a testament to the triumph of human spirit over the relentless onslaught of war. The Luftwaffe, having faced an unbowed wrath, suspended its plans for invasion. Britain, though scarred and battered, stood resolute, and the names of its defenders became synonymous with courage in the face of adversity. The Battle of Britain, while concluding in the skies, resonated far beyond the realm of aerial combat. The names of cities, towns, and villages that had weathered the storm emerged as symbols of a nation that had stared into the abyss and refused to yield. The victory in the skies over Britain became a turning point, altering the trajectory of the war and inspiring Allied forces as they prepared for the arduous campaigns that lay ahead. In the late summer of 1939, the geopolitical stage was set for a chilling and momentous turn of events that would cast a dark shadow over the world. On August 23, 1939, two ideological adversaries, Nazi Germany under Adolf Hitler and the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin, shocked the international community by signing the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, a non-aggression agreement that would have far-reaching consequences. This unholy alliance, born out of Machiavellian pragmatism, would reshape the contours of power in Europe and pave the way for the tumultuous events that would unfold in the coming years. The ink on the pact had barely dried when the world awoke her to the startling news of a non-aggression agreement between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Ribbentrop the suave German foreign minister and Molotov, his Soviet counterpart, had negotiated a pact that, on the surface, pledged non-belligerence between the two nations. However, the clandestine clauses of the pact contained a sinister agenda that would shock the world and plunge it into the abyss of World War II. The geopolitical ramifications of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was seismic for Hitler. The pact provided a strategic reprieve, ensuring that Germany would not face a two-front war. The diplomatic maneuvering displayed Hitler's cunning as he temporarily secured the Eastern Front before launching his audacious invasion of Poland. For Stalin, the pact was a pragmatic move, buying time for the Soviet Union to fortify its defenses against the looming threat of German aggression. The unsuspecting nations of Eastern Europe, caught in the crosshairs of this malevolent alliance, faced an uncertain fate. Poland, a nation sandwiched between the two predatory powers, bore the brunt of this geopolitical collusion. The invasion of Poland, which unfolded with brutal efficiency on September 1st, 1939 marked the beginning of World War II. The Nazi-Soviet Pact, often referred to as the Pact of Steel and Ice, had unleashed the dogs of war upon an unsuspecting world. As German tanks rolled across the Polish border, the thunderous echoes of artillery fire drowned out the cries of a nation on the brink of devastation. The swift and coordinated assault by the German Blitzkrieg, coupled with the subsequent Soviet invasion from the east on September 17, 1939, left Poland reeling under the onslaught of two totalitarian regimes. The world watched in horror as Poland, a nation with a storied history and rich cultural heritage, became the crucible of a conflict that would soon engulf the globe. The toll on human lives was staggering. The invasion of Poland, orchestrated by the combined forces of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, resulted in the deaths of tens of thousands of Polish soldiers and civilians. The brutality of the German-Soviet occupation 
marked by massacres, forced labor, and the displacement of populations laid bare the ruthlessness of totalitarian regimes unchecked by the norms of international law. In the diplomatic corridors of power, the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact sent shockwaves through the Western powers. The realization that the two ideological adversaries had forged an unholy alliance fueled a sense of trepidation and urgency. The failure of collective security measures and the specter of appeasement now loomed large over the geopolitical landscape, prompting a re-evaluation of strategies and alliances. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, initially seen as a tactical maneuver by both Hitler and Stalin, would ultimately unravel with the surprise German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941. The ideological fissures between National Socialism and Soviet Communism, temporarily papered over by the Pact, would it erupt into a titanic struggle on the Eastern Front, reshaping the trajectory of World War II. As the world grappled with the implications of the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact, the seeds of global conflict had been sown. The story of this unholy alliance became a cautionary tale, underscoring the perilous consequences of real politic devoid of moral constraints. In the unfolding drama of World War II, the pact served as a prologue to the cataclysm that awaited, a stark reminder that the fates of nations hung in the balance of geopolitical machinations that played out on the grand stage of history. The German-Soviet pact was an agreement signed by Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. On August 23, 1939, German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop and Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov negotiated it. The pact goes by several names. German-Soviet pact, Molotov-Ribbentrop pact, Nazi-Soviet pact, and Hitler-Stalin pact. The German-Soviet pact consisted of two parts, one public and one secret. The public part was a non-aggression pact in which each country promised not to attack the other. They also agreed not to provide assistance to a third country that attacked either of them. In addition, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union agreed not to participate with other countries in an arrangement that would affect the other directly or indirectly. The non-aggression agreement was to last for 10 years. It could be automatically renewed for an additional five years if neither party moved to end it. The secret part of the pact was a protocol that established Soviet and German spheres of influence in Eastern Europe. Estonia, Latvia, and Bessarabia fell within the Soviet sphere according to the protocol. The signatories agreed to divide Poland along the line of the Narev, Vistula, and Sun Rivers. Hitler regarded the German-Soviet non-aggression pact as a tactical and temporary maneuver. He never intended to uphold the terms of the agreement for 10 years. His long-range plan was for German forces to attack the Soviet Union and establish Lebensraum, living space, for the Germans in their territories they seized. Before taking this step, however, Hitler intended to subdue Poland and defeat France and Great Britain. The non-aggression pact allowed Germany to focus on those goals without fear of a Soviet attack. The pact enabled Nazi Germany to avoid war on two fronts, Western and Eastern, for a while. In July 1940, one month after Germany defeated France, Hitler ordered preparations for war against the Soviet Union. German diplomats worked to secure Germany's flank in Southeast Europe. In November 1940, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia joined the Axis alliance. During the spring of 1941, Hitler initiated his European allies into plans to invade the Soviet Union. On December 18, 1940, Hitler signed Directive 21, codenamed Operation Barbarossa. This directive 
was the first operational order for the invasion of the Soviet Union. From the time they began planning the invasion, German military and police authorities intended to wage a war of annihilation. They considered their enemies to be the Soviet Union's Judeo-Bolshevik communist government, as well as Soviet citizens, particularly the Jews. On June 22, 1941, German forces invaded the Soviet Union. This marked the end of the German-Soviet Pact. It had lasted for less than two years. In the early days of April 1940, as the European continent still echoed with the distant rumblings of war, a sudden and audacious move by the German army cast a shadow over the serene landscapes of Denmark and Norway. April 9, 1940 became a day etched in the annals of World War II as the Wehrmacht, under the command of Adolf Hitler, launched swift and coordinated invasion that would alter the course of the conflict and plunge Scandinavia into the crucible of war. The unsuspecting nations of Denmark and Norway awoke to the ominous sound of German boots trampling across their soil. The strategic imperative behind the invasion was clear. The Germans sought to secure vital sea routes and establish a foothold in the North Atlantic safeguarding access to crucial resources, the names of the cities and towns where the invasion unfolded. Copenhagen, Oslo, Bergen became synonymous with the sudden upheaval that swept across the tranquil landscapes. The invasion of Denmark was a swift and virtually unopposed affair. German forces, utilizing a combination of airborne and amphibious tactics, seized key objectives with a precision that left the Danish defences reeling. King Christian Wengert, facing an overwhelming force, reluctantly acquiesced to the German demands to avoid unnecessary bloodshed. Denmark, a nation caught in the crossfire of larger geopolitical ambitions, succumbed to the inexorable advance of the German war machine. In Norway, the invasion unfolded with a different cadence. German paratroopers, dropping from the skies and daring airborne assaults, targeted strategic locations with the precision of a well-choreographed ballet. The names of the fjords, Narvik, Trondheim, Kristiansand, became battlegrounds where the Norwegian defenders, though outnumbered and outgunned, displayed tenacity and courage in the face of an unexpected onslaught. As the Norwegian coastal cities faced the brunt of the German offensive, the Allies, caught off guard by the audacity of the move, uh, scrambled to respond. The British and French forces, deploying troops to support Norway, found themselves in a race against time. The harsh and unforgiving terrain of Norway, with its icy fjords and snow-capped mountains, became a formidable adversary in addition to the German invaders. The Battle of Narvik, a pivotal engagement in the early stages of the Norwegian campaign, saw fierce fighting between German and Allied forces. The strategic importance of the port city, nestled at the crossroads of vital sea routes, became a focal point where the aspirations of the Axis powers clashed with the desperate defense mounted by the Allies. The numbers of soldiers who perished in the icy landscapes of Narvik underscored the brutality of a conflict that unfolded in the pristine beauty of Norway's natural vistas. The Norwegian royal family, 
symbolizing the resilience of the nation, faced the trials of war with stoic resolve. King Hakon VII, Queen Maud, and Crown Prince Olav became symbols of national unity as they resisted the German occupation. Their flight to safety and subsequent exile in London cast a poignant shadow over a nation grappling with the harsh realities of occupation. In the weeks that followed, as the German forces consolidated their control over Denmark and Norway, the world watched with a mixture of horror and fascination. The invasion, though strategically sound from a military perspective, carried profound implications for the course of the war. The names of the generals, von Falkenhorst, von Bottischer, and the locations of the German High Command's deliberations in Berlin became waypoints in the unfolding narrative of global conflict. The occupation of Norway, however, did not quell the flames of resistance. The Norwegian people, inspired by the example set by their royal family and fueled by an indomitable spirit, began a clandestine struggle against the occupiers. The names of the resistance fighters, Max Manus, Gunnar Sonstebe, became legendary as they waged a guerrilla war against the German forces. As the war raged on and the occupation persisted, the fate of Denmark and Norway became a microcosm of the larger conflagration that engulfed the world. The Norwegian merchant fleet, crucial for the transportation of vital resources, faced the perils of German U-boats and naval blockades. The Danish people, though initially spared the worst of the occupation, grappled with the moral complexities of collaboration and resistance. The invasion of Denmark and Norway, though overshadowed by larger conflicts on the eastern and western fronts, held a unique place in the tapestry of World War II. The swift and audacious move by the German army set in motion a chain of events that would shape the destinies of nations and individuals alike. The names of the cities and fjords, the faces of the resistance fighters, and the decisions made by leaders in the corridors of power became integral threads in the intricate narrative of a war that spared no corner of the globe. On April 9th, 1940, German warships enter major Norwegian ports from Narvik to Oslo deploying thousands of German troops and occupying Norway. At the same time, German forces occupied Copenhagen, among other Danish cities. German forces were able to slip through the mines Britain had laid around Norwegian ports because local garrisons were ordered to allow the Germans to land unopposed. The order came from a Norwegian commander loyal to Norway's pro-fascist former Foreign Minister Vidkun Quisling. Hours after the invasion, the German minister in Oslo demanded Norway's surrender. The Norwegian government refused, and the Germans responded with a parachute invasion and the establishment of a puppet regime led by Quisling, whose name would become a synonym for traitor. Norwegian forces refused to accept German rule in the guise of a Quisling government and continued to fight alongside British troops. But an accelerating German offensive in France led Britain to transfer thousands of soldiers from Norway to France, resulting ultimately in a German victory. In Denmark, King Christian Kex convinced his army could not fight off a German invasion, surrendered almost immediately. Hitler now added a second and third conquered nation to his quarry, which began with Poland.
waning days of summer in 1939, a tempest of war gathered on the eastern horizon, casting its ominous shadow over the tranquil landscape of Poland. On the fateful day of September 1st, 1939, the world stood witness to an unparalleled act of aggression as the German army, under the command of Adolf Hitler, unleashed a devastating onslaught on Poland. The invasion, marked by the thunderous roar of tanks, the trampling of marching boots, and the piercing wail of sirens heralded the beginning of a cataclysmic conflict that would soon engulf the globe in the conflagration of World War II. The Polish people, nestled between the juggernauts of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, awoke to the thunderous roar of German blitzkrieg, a relentless and coordinated assault that sought to crush their nation in a swift and decisive blow. The German war machine, honed and refined after years of military rearmament, surged across the borders with ruthless efficiency. Employing tactics that left the world in awe and terror, the skies, once serene, were now painted with the ominous trails of Luftwaffe bombers as they carpet-bombed Polish cities and military installations. Warsaw, the historic capital of Poland, found itself under siege, a city thrust into the crucible of war. The resolute defenders of Poland, ill-equipped and outnumbered, fought valiantly against overwhelming odds. The streets echoed with the cacophony of gunfire, the desperate cries of civilians seeking refuge, and the haunting wail of air raid sirens. The royal castle, a symbol of Polish heritage and resilience, now faced the specter of destruction as German artillery shells rained down upon its venerable walls. As the German army advanced, relentless in its pursuit of territorial conquest, the international community grappled with the swift and audacious invasion. The Poles, who had weathered centuries of tumultuous history, now found themselves standing alone against the mechanized might of Hitler's war machine. The diplomatic overtures and futile protests that echoed from the corridors of world capitals did little to stem the tide of aggression that engulfed Poland. In the shadow of the German invasion, the Soviet Union, in accordance with the secret protocols of the molotov bentrop Pact, launched its own assault on Poland from the east on September 17, 1939. The Poles, already grappling with the relentless German onslaught, now faced the dual threat of invasion from two totalitarian regimes. The division of Poland, agreed upon in the secret clauses of the pact, marked the beginning of a tragic chapter in Polish history. The toll on human lives was staggering. The invasion of Poland, orchestrated both by both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, resulted in the deaths of tens of thousands of Polish soldiers and civilians. The brutality of the occupation, marked by massacres, forced labor, and the displacement of populations, laid bare the ruthlessness of totalitarian regimes unchecked by the norms of international law. As the days turned into weeks, Poland, once a vibrant nation with a rich cultural heritage, became a battleground and a graveyard. The echoes of the invasion reverberated through the corridors of history, leaving an indelible mark on the collective consciousness of a world thrust into the maelstrom of global conflict. The siege of Poland, far from being a mere military campaign, became a symbol of defiance and sacrifice. As the Poles, against overwhelming odds, fought valiantly for their homeland. The invasion of Poland, a harbinger of the larger conflagration that would become World War II, set in motion a cascade of events that would shape the destiny of nations. The story of September 1st, 1939, etched in the blood-soaked soil of Poland, became a prologue to the cataclysmic events 
that would unfold in the years to come. In the aftermath of the invasion, as the fires of war engulfed Europe, the world grappled with the harsh reality that the spectre of conflict, once confined to the distant horizon, now loomed large over the collective conscience of humanity. Germany invaded Poland. To justify the action, Nazi propagandists accused Poland of persecuting ethnic Germans living in Poland. They also falsely claimed that Poland was planning, with its allies, Great Britain and France, to encircle and dismember Germany. The SS, in collusion with the German military, staged a phony attack on a German radio station. The Germans falsely accused the Poles of this attack. Hitler then used the action to launch a retaliatory campaign against Poland. Germany launched the unprovoked attack at dawn on September 1st, 1939, with an advance force consisting of more than 2,000 tanks, supported by nearly 900 bombers and over 400 fighter planes. In all, Germany deployed 60 divisions and nearly 1.5 million men in the invasion. From East Prussia and Germany in the north, and Silesia and Slovakia in the south, German units quickly broke through Polish defenses along the border and advanced on Warsaw in a massive encirclement attack. Poland mobilized late and political considerations forced its army into a disadvantageous deployment. The Polish army also lacked modern arms and equipment, had few armored and motorized units, and could deploy little more than 300 planes, most of which the Luftwaffe destroyed in the first few days of the invasion, despite fighting tenaciously and inflicting serious casualties on the Germans, the Polish army was defeated within weeks. The world adopted a new term to describe Germany's successful war tactic. Blitzkrieg or lightning war. The tactic consisted of staging a surprise attack with massive concentrated forces of fast moving armored units supported by overwhelming air power. Britain and France stood by their guarantee of Poland's border and declared war on Germany on September 3rd, 1939. However, Poland found itself fighting a two-front war when the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east on September 17th. The Polish government fled the country that same day. After heavy shelling and bombing, Warsaw officially surrendered to the Germans on September 28th, 1939, in accordance with the secret protocol to their non-aggression pact. Germany and the Soviet Union partitioned Poland on September 29th, 1939. The demarcation line was along the Bug River. In October 1939, Germany directly annexed former Polish territories along Germany's eastern border. West Prussia, Poznan, Poznan, Upper Silesia, and the former free city of Danzig the remainder of German-occupied Poland, including the cities of Warsaw, Krakow, Krakow, Ludom, and Lublin, was organized as the so-called General Government, General Government, and a civilian governor general, the Nazi party lawyer, Hans Frank. In June 1941, Nazi Germany invaded Soviet-occupied Eastern Poland as part of its attack on the Soviet Union. Eventually, Nazi Germany occupied all of pre-war Poland. The German occupation of Poland came to an end as the Soviet Red Army view. This term in the glossary forced the German military to retreat through the country towards Berlin in 1944 and early 1945.
the echoes of war unleashed by the invasion of Poland on September 1, 1939, reverberated across Europe, a grim symphony that heralded the dawn of a conflict that would engulf the world as the thunderous cacophony of artillery fire and the haunting wails of air raid sirens resonated through Polish cities, the leaders of Britain and France faced a momentous decision that would shape the trajectory of history. On September 3rd, 1939, with a heavy heart and a solemn resolve, Britain and France declared war on Germany, plunging the continent into the maelstrom of World War II. In the hallowed halls of power, amidst the flickering shadows cast by the flames of war, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain addressed the nation, delivering a speech that would echo through the corridors of history. The Munich Agreement, hailed as a noble effort to secure peace for our time, lay shattered in the wake of German aggression. The diplomatic overtures and futile pleas for reason had proven impotent against the unbridled ambitions of Adolf Hitler. In a voice tinged with sorrow and determination, Chamberlain announced that a state of war existed between Britain and Germany. Across the English Channel in the corridors of power in France, a similar declaration was dounded. Prime Minister Edouard de Ladier his visage etched with the burdens of leadership in tumultuous times, addressed the French nation. The Maginot Line, once considered an impregnable fortress, now faced the test of reality. The French Republic, intertwined with its British ally in a solemn pact, stood resolute against the advancing tide of German militarism. The die had been cast, and the destinies of nations were now entwined in the crucible of war. As the news of Britain and France's declaration of war on Germany rippled through the international community, the world held its breath. The geopolitical landscape had shifted, and the conflagration that had begun in the heart of Europe now threatened to engulf the entire continent. The specter of a global conflict, once deemed a distant nightmare, now loomed large over the collective consciousness of humanity. The phony war, a deceptively quiet period in the early months of the conflict, settled over Europe. The front lines established by the German invasion of Poland remained relatively static. Yet beneath the surface, the gears of war churned relentlessly, the Allies grappling with the realities of a mechanized war and the strategic intricacies of a shifting battlefield prepared for the storm that was destined to break. In the ensuing months, the world witnessed the unfolding drama of the phony war. Marked by sporadic clashes and uneasy calm, the Maginot Line, a symbol of French military might, faced the looming threats of a German blitzkrieg that would soon reshape the course of history the anticipation, the uncertainty, and the latent tension pervaded the collective psyche of a world teetering on the precipice of a global cataclysm. As the winter of 1939 yielded to the spring of 1940, the war machine that had ground to a temporary halt now surged forward. The Blitzkrieg, a lightning-fast and devastating military strategy, shattered the illusions of a protracted stalemate. Germany's invasion of France, launched on May 10, 1940, unfolded with an audacity that left the Allies reeling. The fall of France, marked by the swift advance of German forces through the Ardennes and the subsequent evacuation of Allied troops from Dunkirk, cast a long and ominous shadow over the war. The triumphs and tribulations of those early months, culminating in the evacuation that would be remembered as the miracle of Dunkirk, underscored the harsh realities of a conflict that defied easy predictions. As the world bore witness to the unfolding events, the numbers of deaths and the scale of human suffering became staggering. 
The toll on military personnel and civilians alike painted a harrowing picture of the cost of war. The decisions made on September 3, 1939 had set in motion a chain of events that would redefine the very fabric of nations and test the resilience of the human spirit. The declaration of war by Britain and France on September 3, 1939 marked the definitive moment when the gathering storm of conflict broke over the shores of Western Europe. The commitment to stand against the tide of aggression, born out of a collective desire for freedom and justice, became the rallying cry for nations thrust into the crucible of war. The narrative of those early days, woven with the names of leaders, locations of strategic importance, and the human toll, became the prologue to a saga that would unfold across continents and generations. The world, now irreversibly entangled in the throes of war, faced an uncertain future as the relentless march of history pressed on. The first casualty of that declaration was not German, but the British ocean liner Athenia, which was sunk by a German U-30 submarine that had assumed the liner was armed and belligerent. There were more than 100 passengers on board, 112 of whom lost their lives. Of those, 28 were Americans, but President Roosevelt was unfazed by the tragedy declaring that no one was to thoughtlessly or falsely talk of America sending its armies to European fields. The United States would remain neutral. As for Britain's response, it was initially no more than the dropping of anti-Nazi propaganda leaflets. Thirteen tons of them. Over Germany, they would begin bombing German ships on September 4th, suffering significant losses they were also working under orders not to harm German civilians. The German military, of course, had no such restrictions. France would begin an offensive against Germany's western border two weeks later. Their effort was weakened by a narrow 90-mile window leading to the German front, enclosed by the borders of Luxembourg and Belgium, both neutral countries. The Germans mined the passage stalling the French offensive. Tensions in Europe had been building for years, and there was a growing feeling that German aggression needed to be confronted with force. The British reluctantly accepted that war was necessary to stop Hitler. Germany represented a direct threat to British security and the security of its empire. Accepting German domination of Europe had grave implications for British status and survival. Britain went to war in 1939 to defend the balance of power in Europe and safeguard Britain's position in the world. On August 13, 1940, 
The hushed morning air over the English Channel held an intangible tension, an ominous precursor to the symphony of conflict that would soon engulf the skies. This was the dawn of the Battle of Britain, a seminal chapter in World War II that would see the Luftwaffe, the German army, commence relentless aerial bombardment on British soil. The names of the city and towns, London, Liverpool, Southampton, would become the front lines of an unprecedented clash and the fate of a nation would hang in the balance. The Luftwaffe, under the command of Reichs Marshal Hermann Göring, unleashes aerial armada with the names of seasoned fighters such as pilot Adolf Galland, Werner Mulders and Helmut Wick soaring at its vanguard. The names of Messerschmitt's BF 109s and Junkers Ju 87 Stukas became synonymous with the impending onslaught. And the English countryside braced for impact. The strategic objective was clear to break the spirit of the British people and pave the way for a German invasion. In Britain, the Royal Air Force airfields, Biggin Hill, Duxford and Manston transformed into bustling hubs of frenetic energy. The drones of engines and the silhouettes of supermarine spitfires and hawker hurricanes mark the defensive bastions against the impending aerial storm. The names of RAF commanders like Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding and Air Vice Marshal Keith Park resonate through the corridors of strategy as they orchestrated the defence of their homeland. The first wave of Luftwaffe raids heralding a new era of warfare unfolded with names like Adler Tag, Eagle Day, the southern coast of England such as Dover, Folkestone and Ramsgate etched in the collective consciousness bore witness to the ferocity of aerial combat. The White Cliffs, stoic sentinels against the impending storm, became silent witnesses to the unfurling drama in the azure skies above. The Battle of Britain, though fought primarily in the air, touched the lives of civilians on the ground. Londoners sheltering in the underground station during the Blitz and the Dissensians of Coventry, Birmingham and Manchester faced the wrath of aerial bombardment, the wailing air raid sirens, a haunting prelude to destruction, echoed through the names of British streets and neighbourhoods, and the nightly blackout became a symbolic shroud against the Luftwaffe's aerial incursions. As the conflict escalated, the individual dogfights became chapters in this aerial epic. The skies over the English Channel, of which would resonate through history, witnessed dogfights that pitted the iconic Spitfires and Hurricanes against the sleek BF-109s. The aerial manoeuvres, Imolins, Spitz, SS and bow rolls became the vocabulary of duelling pilots high above the clouds. The east end of London, such as Bethnal Green and Stepney, bore the scars of the Brits. The St Paul's Cathedral, and Buckingham Palace, iconic symbols of British resilience, stood defiant against the Luftwaffe's relentless assault. The nightly bombings, etched in the diaries of those who endured them, painted a tableau of destruction and endurance. The British people, with their names on recorded in the grand tapestry of history, became symbols of stoicism and resolve. The names of air raid wardens patrolling the darkened streets and the fire watchers vigilant against the infernos, and of course the ordinary citizens finding shelter in Anderson and Morrison's shelters formed the backbone of a nation's resilience. The Battle of Britain, far from being a conflict waged solely in the ethereal realms of the sky, manifested itself in the collective courage of a people united against a common foe. The narrative of the Battle of Britain, woven through the loom of time, saw the names of Luftwaffe bombers Henkel, He, 111S and Dorner Du, 17S, darkened the daytime skies. The names of British anti-aircraft batteries strategically placed in cities and countryside filled the air with the rat-a-tat of their artillery. The cities of Plymouth, Southampton and Hull, though not the primary targets, bore witness to the indiscriminate nature of aerial warfare. September 15th, 1940, 
a day etched in history, emerged as a pivotal moment, a climax to the Battle of Britain. The British and German pilots clashed in the heavens in a ferocious crescendo, the Luftwaffe having faced the tenacious resilience of the RAF, shifted its focus away from civilian targets, signalling a strategic shift. The Battle of Britain, though not defensively concluded, saw the British resolve and courage standing firm against the onslaught. The autumn winds of 1940 ushered in a respite, but the names of those lost, both in the air and on the ground, haunted the collective memory. The Battle of Britain, though ostensibly a victory for the RAF, carried the names of fallen heroes, pilots whose aircraft vanished into the clouds and civilians whose homes lay in ruins. The names of Winston Churchill, echoing through the chambers of Parliament, acknowledged the valour of those who had withstood the aerial siege. The aftermath of the Battle of Britain, inscribed in the Chronicles of War, saw a nation rebuilding against the ruins. The names of airfields transformed into memorials, and the names of those who stood against the aerial onslaught became legends. The Luftwaffe, having failed to break the British spirit, shifted its focus to the Eastern Front and the Battle of Britain became a pivotal moment in the broader canvas of World War II. The British city, scarred and battered, became testaments to resilience. The names of fighter aces such as Douglas Bader, Sailor Mallon and Robert Stanford Tuck resonate as beacons of courage. The air raid shelters and bomb sites became artifacts of war-torn era etching their presence into an urban landscape. As the war progressed, the Battle of Britain, embedded in the nation's consciousness, faded into the background of a conflict that would witness greater upheavals. The names of subsequent battles of El Alamein, Stalingrad and Normandy etched themselves into the narrative of world at war. The Battle of Britain, though a pivotal moment, became one thread in the rich tapestry of human history its names fading into the ebb of time. We really do love making these videos and researching back into history. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, subscribing and turning on the notification bell as it will let you know when we upload more videos.